is, you know, works pretty well. Uh, what would you do if no, what would you do if this, if the size n, the set of all possible elements, was so large it didn't fit in memory, right? So this was, say you're looking at um, some, you're, uh, um, you're sitting on a router, and and you have some packet which is being routed to a set of IP addresses, and you want to see if it's being routed to, you know, it's being split at the router, and so there there are many IP addresses which commonly um, are are occurring together, right? So so you so you so you don't want to um, store this um, store this number n in memory. Then then how can you speed up? How can you possibly speed up this algorithm? You don't want to keep keep a counter for each one of those things in memory because it's not going to fit in memory, or because you're on a router, you have very limited space. <clears throat> Okay, so who's in class on Monday? All right, okay, okay, good, good, good. Okay, now let me ask the question again. How would you, how would you deal with this more space? I was gonna say heavy header seems perfect for this. Um, right. Well, yeah. um, exactly, right. So, so the, the heavy header you know, problem, either with the Misha Grease algorithm or the Kalman sketch, is, is going to return you know, all of the things which are above a threshold. Right? So let's say I set the threshold, this epsilon at like, uh, um, if I set epsilon at 10%, right, then I'm gonna, with the Misha Gries algorithm, I'm only gonna need 10 counters, and I'm gonna guarantee that, um, well, I'm almost gonna guarantee that, um, that, that if I have 10 counters, I'm gonna have everything that occurs above 10% of the time. I might also have some other stuff in there. Um, and so I might accidentally keep some things around which don't occur that often. Um, so there, um, so, um, so, um, so it, if, if these things are not, um, so, you know, I may have some extra things, but the, all that means is that I've pruned it, um, this a little bit less, right? So I'll, I'll Maybe I'll have too many counters in, in the next round, but maybe not by um, um, by um, um, by such a large amount. Um, okay, but does if I if if I if I set say epsilon to be um, one over k, and I have k um, um, counters, and then I use the Misha Grease algorithm. I use the Misha Grease algorithm, am I going to guarantee to find all of the items which occur more than an epsilon fraction of time? Is this going to work? Um, who thinks this works? And who's skeptical because I'm, because I'm asking you? And who is just not raising their hand? OK. Who is not, not raising their hand? OK, that's better. Uh, um, right, so, the, so the, this Misha Grease algorithm is not quite, is, is, is not quite going to work. The reason was, with this algorithm, every tuple had only one thing in it, right? So if it occurred in 10% in, in of the items, then the, there are only 90% of the items left that other things couldn't have occurred. I can easily have, if, if each tuple is of size 10, or as each tuple is, if each tuple is, is, is of size 11, I can have 11 different things which occur in all of the tuples, right? If everyone buys the same 11 things, right? Um, then I, if I only have 10 counters, one of those things I can't count, but it occurred every single time, right? So I can't um, just directly use this because of that, because I'm, I'm going to have to look at the total number of, of items and count the fraction of those, right? So, so it's not quite going to work. But so it, it, if I said something like um, that, um, let's say that t max is going to be equal to the maximum um, 
size of, of all the tuples. Right? If, if T max is the maximum size of any tuple, that means how many elements it has. Right? Then, then if I want to count at epsilon, all things above an epsilon fraction of the time, then how many counters do I need to keep? T max k. What? T max times k. Yes. Yeah, so um, then T max, so, so then the number of counters is going to be T max um, divided by epsilon. Right, so if epsilon is 10%, then this is 10 times T max. Okay, so, so if, if T max is something like, uh, um, is, is something like 80, the most things on a shopping receipt is 80. Maybe this is too low, but in, in general this is probably true. So I know I've been to the store and bought more than 80 things once or twice for like a big party or something, but, but it's, you know, pretty rare. Um, and so let's say 80 over, over 10, that you only need 800 counters. This 800, the important thing about this number 800, right, so let's say this is 800. Well, this is going to be independent of the size of M or of N. It only depends on the maximum size of the tuple and the amount of, um, and, the, and the threshold at which you want to find these co-occurring things. Even if this epsilon is one over 100, then this is only 8,000. But this is still something that's going to fit in, it's going to fit in memory. And you're probably going to have far fewer than this 8,000 things actually survive. So when you go to, um, you know, how many things survive, um, choose two for the sets of size two, it's still probably going to be below this. And so usually the, the round that requires the most space is usually going to be the first round. Sometimes it's going to be the second round. Sometimes these are, but these are usually about on the same order of each other. And then things are going to quickly decrease afterwards. Um, so this, um, this, this idea of counting these, two, these co occurring tuples you know, is not just something that occurs in uh, 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 these day mine applications. So one of, one of these, uh, one of these recent kind of key problems people have been looking at in uh, um, computational geometry is to find something called a simplex, which is is kind of a is 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 the generalization of um, a point is a zero simplex, a line segment between two points is a one simplex, a triangle among three points is a two simplex, a tetrahedron among four points is a four simplex, and you're trying to find these simplex the simplices forms a um, simplicial complex, and and looking for all simplicial complexes in, in high dimensions, um, the the dimension is the number of points you can consider is is a really hard problem. But the most efficient way to actually try and find the ones that that exist, you know, use a very similar algorithm to this, where you you first scan all the ones, um, all you first find all the pairs that exist, and use these to filter all the all the triangles which can possibly exist and use these to filter to look for all the tetrahedrons that can possibly exist. And so this, this is also the most efficient way of doing this in, in, in that setting as well. So, so this is kind of, uh, um, there's a pretty neat trick that, that occurs when you're trying to count these, try to find these, these, uh, these sets which, which, um, which are co-occurring. Um, So, all right, so th th this is about all I wanted to say about this algorithm. Um, so I, I wanted to, so if you look at some of the literature on how to speed this up, um, one, one common thing people have used is called a bloom filter. So, so who's, who's heard of a bloom filter? Okay, so you, uh, if you heard of it, or do you, do you know how it works, or? Uh, I think I implemented one for space yeah. forever ago, yeah. You implemented one, all right. So, um, so, 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 the, so the next thing I'm gonna explain is how to, uh, 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 what a bloom filter is, and, and then we can discuss, you know, if we, if we think this is a good match for this, uh, um, for this argument as well. Um, uh, 
Um, so a film filter is another streaming algorithm, and the goal is to keep track of um, which items have occurred. Um, in, in a, um, um, which items have occurred in a large stream, right? So we're going to have the stream of items. Um, um, the stream of items are coming in, um, and it's it's this m is very large, and each ai is going to be an element of the set n, and both n and m are going to be very large. And what we want to do is to build a data structure on A um, so that, um, so this is a data structure. Um, so, so that we can query um, is, is Q in, in A. And so answering this, this question exactly is, is going to be hard. Um, so always returning yes if it's in and no if it's not is going to be hard. So we're going to have, so we're going to say if Q in, in A always, you know, answer yes. And, and if Q is not in A, usually answer no. So if it's in there, we're always going to find it. We're not going to have any um, false negatives, right? But we might have some false positives. Sometimes it's not in there, and we're going to say it, it is in there, but it's really not. And we're going to hope that we're not going to have a lot of these false positives. And so, and so again, this is going to be this huge stream. We want to do this with a very small space. Okay, and so this 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 data structure again is going to be like a lot of these streaming algorithms. It's going to be extremely simple. It's going to be a very simple thing to do. And what we're going to do is we're going to store. Uh, let me see if. Um, we're going to have um, again. We're going to have k. Um, hash functions h1 through hk. Uh, these are going to be chosen independently, um, and trying to get. M already. Okay, so let's say H I goes from N to uh, to large M, um, where this M is is going to be something um, that's not too large. I'll, I'll tell you what value you should choose for M um, a little bit later. Um, so so and, and so instead of storing a counter. For each of these things, we're just going to store one bit, um, so, and we're only going to store um, just one array. So this is, you know, th this array one, two, three, up to n minus one, n, n minus one, n. and and each of these is going to be a bit. So we start by um, set all m fits to 0. Um, OK, so we'll start here. And then we're going to process this stream. Um, so, that, so, so then for i equals 1 to, um, to small m now, we're going to say, um, and then for j equals 1 to k, for, for all these hash functions, we're going to we're going to call this 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 array b. Set b of hash of j of a i to one. So if it's already set to one, then we don't have to do anything. We can overwrite it. But if it's zero, then we change it to one. Okay. 
Okay, so, so, so we're going to come in and we're going to just fill this up with one. But the thing is, all of these hash functions are indexing this um, on the same array now. Okay, so we're not doing, and with the count min sketch, we had these k separate of these arrays. Now we're just using one array, and we're not even using a counter, we're just using bits. Okay, so, um, so now on a query, uh, on a query to be, um, um, so if we have this query, how do we answer if Q is, is, is stored in this, in this array? This is called, this array is called the Bloom filter. So how do we, how do we query if, if some Q is in this, in, is in the Bloom filter? Where Q is, is one of these elements of in N. We perform all the hashes and then we check if they're all one. Right. So return yes if and only if um, if um, for all J is equal to one. So only if all of the locations are filled, right? Because if this if this element came through. And it was, um, and, and and one of these is set to zero. It, if it came through, then all the hash function, all the hash functions set their bits to one. So so it, it needs for all the things to be one. If any of them is zero, that means this element could not have been passed through the book. Um, so you can so, so it's, it's it's kind of like a hash table, right? So it's kind of like just a simple hash table. Where with a, with a single hash table, you have a single hash function, usually, right? You have a single hash function, you hash to a bin, and then if it's in there, you say, um, yes, this element occurs, but sometimes you have these collisions, right? So if you have a collision, you need to store something extra. Say you have a list of all the things stored at this location, um, or maybe you hash to, you know, uh, or you at least store this one thing. If it's not there, then you keep looking down the list until you find an empty spot and you, you put it in there. All these storing things turns out to be very expensive if you're really being conservative about space. You don't even want to store these labels, right? Remember, I said that um, you know most times the space here we were looking at was something you know about log n plus log m where. The, the log n was required to just store one label on, on these, uh, um, um, just one label of these elements. Here, we're not even storing these labels. So these, these hash functions need to uh, essentially be size large enough to do these labels, but the structure itself is not. Right? So the bits we're doing is, 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 is not. Um, you know, don't need to store the labels or don't need to have these lists. These list lookups you know, are, are uh, um, are going to be kind of slow also. So and if you have copies of this, then you can you can do this in parallel with the different hash functions to check if something is in there. So you can do this very quickly. Um, okay. So um, so it, um, yeah. So then otherwise uh, return. Okay. okay so. Um, so I said there's sometimes you return no, or sometimes you return yes even when you should return yes, right? Sometimes you can have these false positives. So how often are we going to have these false positives? Right, so the, the larger that, that big M is, the more, the less likely we have false positives. Okay, so let me try and roughly go, to, go through the analysis here. Um, let's see, so. Um, so let's see, so one, one minus one over, over M is, is equal to the probability that a um, um, that a bit not 
um, set to one um, by a single um, hash of an element, right? So if we hash, if, if we hash one element with one hash function, um, probably one minus one over m, uh, it, it's you know this hash function is is it's, it's going not to be set. So usually it's not going to be set. Um, and so then if we do this with k hash functions instead of one hash function, we have one minus m um, to the k. And so this is you know the probability <coughs> of bit not set by k um, of these hashes, right? Um, so and the, the, then we want to look at um, so is the so if we do this, this is after we set n um, if we if we set n of these elements instead of just one of these, right? Um, so if um, so this is so so the probability of it not set by k hashes on n elements, right? So we instead of just doing one thing where we're we're putting k things into the bloom filter. So this is for n is the number of things we put in the bloom filter. Let me use a large n here. For n things we put in the bloom filter. Um, so, this, uh, so then 1 minus this is 1 minus 1 over m. Okay, n is going to be the probability um, um, of it of it is um, set see by k hashes on n elements, right? So it's just one minus that. And then we want to say the probability of a false positive using k hash functions um, So in order to get a false positive, that means when we hash something into there, it's going to have to hit, it's going to have to hit a bit when it wasn't supposed to, and it's going to have to do it on on, on these on these key separate times, right? So this is the probability. Um, so this is then the probability of a of a um, false positive. Right, so this is probably we 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 so we we have a query we look and and we're going to do k hashes so that's what this is we have k hashes where each of the k hashes has has the bit set even though uh, it should have been set this is the probability it's been set because um, this was the probability it's not set and then we did this um, because we we put n, big n elements in and each element was hashed k times. And this is the probability that a bit was not set, right? So this, so this is the probability of the false positive. Okay, so this expression is pretty uh, hard to make sense of, right? So you can you can simplify this using um, this this um, this log trick that let's see one minus one over n to the n. This is going to be about, or this is going to be about e, right? So you can, for for n large, this is about true. So you can simplify this expression to be one minus e to the negative k n over m. Let's see, this is to the power k. So this is maybe a little bit better, um, but if you if you solve if you know how big m and n are, then you can solve for a k and say about how many hash functions uh, is the right number to use, and it's going to be about um, m over n log two. 
So this is how many hashes. Um, how many hashes do you use? So okay. So, this, so let's look at this expression. So as I increase the number of hash functions, this 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 is the probability of a false positive. This is less than one, so this k drives the probability down every time I multiply it through. And so, um, and so what I want is this interior to be as small as possible already. And so it's one minus this, so I want this e term to be as large as possible. And to make this as, as large as possible, um, let's see, so, so because it's negative, that means I want this exponent to be uh, small. And to make it small, I increase the number m of the, the bits here. So typically, you have some, some constraint on your memory, which is m, right? So the larger here. But then, uh, and then this k is going to drive this, this probability down. This k is going to affect it more outside than inside, usually. Um, but you want to set it about this, and it'll give you the best um, bang for your buck. If you set k to be too large, then you're going to have you're going to have too many of these uh, these collisions. But if you set it to be too small, then in this step you're not going to filter out you're, you're not going to filter out too many because the probability of just hitting if you only have k equal to one, you're probably going to have there's a good chance of having um, you know um, of having some collision. Right? But if you set k equal to, um, if you make that k larger, then the probability of having collisions is, is, you know, having k collisions is going to go down. But if you set it too large, you filled up your entire table with ones. So the table is going to be pretty useless. So you probably, the, the key idea is you probably want about half of them to be ones and half of them to be zeros. And so if you set this accordingly here, that's a that's you know roughly what you're gonna have. Okay, so um, the, there's actually an error um, there, there's actually an error in this analysis. So this this is giving you about the right idea, but this analysis is not quite correct. And so this but actually, this the same analysis has appeared in uh, many, many papers that have talked about mode filters. And this is a common mistake um, where people have repeated this. It's been in you know, some high-profile um, journals that people haven't, haven't caught this mistake in analysis. The actual analysis set is really much messier. Um, and so there's, and, it, and the bounds it give is uh, even harder to interpret than this, if, if you can imagine it. Um, so there's there really not much point in going through it, but on the class webpage I pointed to a paper which points out this mistake in here and tries to give an actual analysis, but it's less comprehensible than even these experiments. All right, so where is the problem? Smiley back there, Razor. So you. So this. You're smiling because I tricked you, right? No, I smile because you told that many people have made this mistake and you. Yeah. Were... So, I mean, in practice, this actually gives a pretty good estimation of what's going on. But the, the problem is in this step here. So. What's, what's happening is that you're assuming that these, um, so when you hash these n elements, where they're going to go is going to be independent. Um, but you, you know, once you've chosen your family of, of um, once you've chosen your family of hash functions, um, this is not independent. You can choose these k for the hash function. You can choose where the k hashes go. Or at least in theory you can. So, so, so these are going to, you know, hash to independent spots. But um, these the, these n elements could be chosen adversarially, and this this step is not quite right. So, um, so, so this step is not 
Um, this is not quite the right analysis. But the, the, this gives you about the right intuition, right? So, you know, my, my point in this class and going through analysis is always to give you the right way of thinking about these things, not to go into the, you know, the, you know, the very deep uh, uh, technical details. And in most places, this gives you the right intuition for what's going on. So, um, so it's, I, I was surprised when I, when I found this too, and it, it may take your head, may t t take a while to wrap your head around, you know, why this is the case. But you can, there's a paper I linked to on the class webpage that, that'll, that goes into more detail on this. All right, so, okay, so, this, so, um, so now we have this bloom filter, which can store a set of items and, and, um, and, and it's, it's going to always return true if the element is in the set. And usually if the element is not in the set, it's, it's going to return no. But it'll have some false positives. But in practice, this works very well. Right? This is really, if you're really pressed for space, this is really the most um, compact way of storing a set with, with, with these sorts of guarantees. And a lot of people have tried to tweak it one way or another, and it really doesn't improve too much on this on this counter. You can't even get any improvements because you're really only storing these bits here. Okay, so so if we have this bloom filter, how could we use it for these um, for these frequent items? So it's a little tricky because you can't use it unaltered. You're going to need to modify this a little bit. So we're not going to store bits here, but let's say we stored counters instead, right? So if we stored counters instead of these bits, then, um, then what we can do is we can store counters here, and then on a query, we can look at all these counters, and we can take um, the minimum of all these counters, just like in the count min sketch. So I, does this, so in, in reading some stuff and preparing for this, there's, I've seen more references to try and use a bloom filter here, but I think actually the count min sketch would work better for space. Um, but the count min sketch has been, the bloom filter has been around for much longer than the count min sketch. Um, but I, again, what you would do, is you would run through all of the tuples and, and you would hash it to some place here. And you would keep a counter, and if, and if the minimum of all the counters was above your threshold, then you would keep, uh, um, then you would keep this element. Right? Um, uh, um, okay, so there's, there's still something, an extra work you have to do for using this version of the counting bloom filter versus instead using um, the Misha Gries algorithm. In the Misha Gries algorithm, when you kept track of, of all these, these counters at each, in, for each size of the sets as you're passing through this, at the end you could just read off the counters. And all the counters had all the things which listed the, which listed the elements, which had um, more than uh, which may have had more than an epsilon fraction of the, occurred in more than an epsilon fraction of the tuples, right? Um, so what would, how would you do that with the bloom filter? How would you find the elements that had more than an epsilon fraction of the tuples? So, the count, so you kept a count here, and if the count was bigger than epsilon times m, then you would, you would want to keep this for the next round. How would you find this in the bloom filter? So how do I know which ones have have a large are going to have a large count? 
which, which sets, which actual sets, because there's no label associated with here, there's only hash functions. I can pass something through and it gets me to account. How do I get the counts, how do I get the right things that are back at? With the Misha Grease algorithm, I had counters and I had labels associated with each other. You rehash and take the minimum, the minimum uh, counter. Yeah, so, um, that's right. So what you have to go through and you have to take each of these um, tuples that you were possibly going to be counting and go through and check each of them in the bloom filter and, and take the minimum count of all these. You have to go through and do this for each one of these. You can't just read it off of the bloom filter. Or the same way with the count and sketch. You can't just read off which are the heavy hitters. You have to go through and check. Now, you know, this, um, this might not be so bad anyways, right? Because in the, in the, you still had to go through a step where you had these possible tuples of size k, and you had to filter them anyways to know only which ones you're keeping track of. Um, so it was important here that you really wanted to keep this parameter n small because the number of hash functions you needed and how well it worked worked if n is small. So you really wanted to only hash the tuples which might have occurred with high frequency. You don't want to worry about hashing the other tuples because those are just going to add noise into this. So you're going to go through and filter these things anyways. And when you filter these things, you're going to have to make a linear pass over them. So now you make a linear pass at the beginning to see which ones are interesting. And then at the end, you go through and do the linear pass on them again. So, um, so, so you have to go through and check, but you are essentially going to pay for something like this cost anyways at the beginning. So there's an extra run. So, um, yeah. So, so that that's a, something to keep in mind. Another advantage of the Misha Grease algorithm over these, in addition to the better space bounds, it also um, you can read off the heavy hitters from the data structure as opposed to having to go through and query them. That's why.